Thank you. I have at times been called Dr. Melanie. Uh, before I had a PhD, uh, one of my Latin students um, in Toronto called me Miss Melly or Miss Melanie, which made me feel like a character from Gone with the Wind because there's a, yeah, and I was like, that's kind of weird, but also adorable. Um, all right. So this is my book. Um, it's got a really nice cover, so I thought I'd make a slide for it. But then we go to our next slide where we have the man of the hour, Augustus. Uh, this is the Augustus Prima Porta, a statue that was made either in his lifetime or shortly afterwards, uh, which was found in his wife's villa outside of Rome um, and is now in the Vatican Museums. But this is Augustus as he wanted to kind of be remembered. Um, he's very noble, very eternally youthful. Uh, the um, bit on his chest is showing a diplomatic um, coup that he was very proud of where he got back some stolen, some lost standards. Um, but not everybody 100% remembered him like this. And here we go to my next slide, which I'm going to read out what it says on it. After Brutus and Cassius were killed, there was no longer any Republican army. And Sextus Pompey was suppressed in Sicily and Lepidus was stripped of power. And after Antony was killed, even the Julian faction had no leader except Caesar, which means Octavian, which means Augustus. After setting aside the name of Triumvir, he called himself consul and said he was content with tribunician power so he could protect the people. Whereupon he seduced the soldiers with gifts, the populace with bread, and everyone with the sweetness of peace. Little by little, his power increased, and he drew unto himself the duties and functions of the Senate, the magistrates, and the laws. No one opposed him, since the fiercest men had fallen either on the line of battle or in the prescriptions, and the rest of the nobility were raised up in wealth and honors according to how much they were ready for slavery. And enriched by the new circumstances, they preferred the present safety to the dangerous past. And that is the Roman historian Tacitus writing a hundred-ish years after Augustus's rise to power. Two later Roman historians like Tacitus. The age of Augustus was a time of significant and permanent change. Augustus's youth saw the last gasp of the Republic, and the smooth transition to the reign of Tiberius after Augustus's death ensured the Republic would not rise again. But the decades between the death of Julius Caesar and the death of his adopted son Augustus were not an uninterrupted progression toward the imperial era, regardless of how they may have appeared in hindsight to people like Tacitus and many others. The Roman people, particularly the elite males among them, did not foolishly or fearfully agree to whatever the regime and the steady march of progress required of them. Indeed, it would not have been apparent to those on the ground that there was a steady march of progress. It might not even have been clear that there was a unified regime with a single message and agenda. This paper is drawn from the introduction to my book, The Crisis of Masculinity in the Age of Augustus. The book addresses one central question. How did the authors of the Triumviral and Augustan periods conceive of themselves and others as men? There have been volumes dedicated to the elite Roman male's self-conception in the Republic and in the Empire. There was a general consensus that this self-conception and the way it was displayed publicly and privately is different in the Republic and in the Empire. Authors, both ancient and modern, situate this change in the Augustan period, which is roughly 44 or 30 BCE to 14 CE, so about a 50-ish year long period. So it appears that there was some kind of crisis of masculinity in the late first century BCE. This crisis was in response to very real changes in the social and political culture of Rome, as it adjusted to one-man rule under the emperors after centuries of rules by an oligarchic aristocracy, which we call the Republic. But ultimately, the source of this crisis of masculinity is not Augustus himself or even the fall of the Republic. The root is the particularly performative and public nature of Roman masculinity. It was not enough for a man to be male or to act in masculine ways in private. Like most characteristics and virtues in Rome, masculinity had a public element. Others needed to know one had it, 
and to be perpetually reminded of that fact. This is why we can label Roman masculinity performative rather than just performed. This term performative refers to characteristics um, that have to be performed over and over again in such a way that the very repetition of the performances, which all interact with and refer to each other, constitute the characteristic. This also means that the performance of masculinity is never really done. If a man stops performing it, he stops possessing it. I should clarify here that the masculinity that I am talking about is primarily upper class or elite masculinity, as that is the group who produced and largely consumed the literary evidence on which most of my analysis is based. I am fairly loosely defining the upper class to include the senatorial class, uh, the equites, which were a group immediately below the senators, uh, wealthy provincials, and anybody who had an education sufficient to allow them to participate in literary culture. It is possible and even likely that men outside of these classes had other ways of performing their masculinity, which may have included some overlap with the elite, but were not entirely the same. And throughout my book, I do investigate what can be known about these other masculinities as much as possible within the limitation of the sources that exist from ancient Rome. So if masculinity is performative and re relies upon constantly reiterated performance, uh, that means the performance has to take place somewhere. And elite Roman masculinity was performed in a variety of arenas many of which were closed to men who did not meet the re meet requirements of wealth or birth. Uh, for example, um, you couldn't be a senator or in the equestrian class unless you had a minimum amount of property. And anybody who was a freed slave, so they were now free but had formerly been a slave, uh, there were restrictions on their political participation in Rome. But for those who did meet the requirements, Ideally, an elite male would hold offices on the cursus honorum, uh, which means course of honors and is the like the official career path for political offices. Uh, he would also be active in military service as an officer. He should be well educated in oratory and maybe philosophy, but he should definitely be knowledgeable about Roman and Greek literature and culture in his personal life. He ought to be a responsible landowner who used his wealth to benefit, benefit his family, friends, and the state. And he must have a well-managed household, a virtuous and fertile wife, respectful and successful children, and a wide network of friends and clients. In the Republic, all of these areas were places where people competed. The Republic had been a competition, a time of competition for honors and glory at least for those few who met the standards of admission. Elite men competed for offices, for commands, for provincial postings, for the love and respect of the people and the recognition of their peers. The physical locations for these competitions included the Roman Forum, the Senate House, private homes, the battlefield, and the courts. Competitions that were held in Rome tended to be the most valuable as they could be witnessed by the most people, well, the most people whose opinions counted. Um, the triumph, for example, which is a victory parade, was a way to bring the honor that had been won on a distant battlefield into Rome to be witnessed by Romans. Ultimately, however, this competition was meant to benefit Rome. Each individual man was supposed to subsume his own interests to those of the state. Roman history is full of tales of Romans who overreached themselves in the search of selfish glory and were ultimately either punished or brought back into the fold. But in the late Republic, there was a rise in, in individual ambition, which was fed by the increased wealth and power from Rome's growing empire. The pre-existing spirit of competition and the importance of performing masculine roles coupled with new opportunities and resources beyond what the early Romans could ever have imagined, allowed for the rise of extremely powerful warlords. First Marius, then Sulla, then Pompey, and finally Julius Caesar, the adopted father of Augustus. This trend then culminates in a final civil war between Octavian, which is Augustus's name when he's young, uh, and Mark Antony, 
um, and was resolved not by a return to the Republican equilibrium, but by the effective end of empire-wide co competition when Augustus successfully defeated, conciliated, or outlived all the other contenders. By the end of his life, Augustus was nominally a princeps, which means first among equals, but is also where we get the word prince. So clearly it doesn't keep meaning first among equals. Um, but in, because in fact, he was a super patron from which all honors and real power flowed. And although elite males did still engage in competition with each other, the aims and forms of these contests were different. This means that Augustus, probably not intentionally, himself did change the terms of, of uh, elite performance of masculinity. But even, even so, uh, the figure of Augustus himself does loom in the background of my study. But outside of the introduction from which my talk today is drawn, he's not actually the main character. Um, he, in, outside of the introduction, he's like a foil or a symbol, and he represents things to the authors whose work is the main focus of, the, of my book. But before I went into what he means to those other people, I started with what we can discover about Augustus's own relationship to Augustan masculinity. His own self-construction also was embedded in the crisis and changes to the performance of masculinity of his era. Augustus is not simply some kind of mastermind dictating to others how they should act, but he's one of the many players in the drama of his time. So this paper focuses on the first section of the book's introduction on Augustus' self-fashioning in a text called the Res Gestae Divi Augusti, which basically means the accomplishments of the divine Augustus. Literally, it means the things having been done, but that's weird in English. Um, in the second part of the introduction, I look at some public art and architecture of the era for places where his self-fashioning intersects with the types of masculine endeavors he encouraged in others. Um, I have left the slides in for that part, and if anybody wants to ask me about any of these monuments, um, you can. But for interest of time, I'm sticking with the, with the race guest eye part. All right, so race guest I Dewey Augustus. The race guest I Dewey Augusti is the longer of two compositions by Octavian slash Augustus that survives to the present day. The original bronzes that were inscribed with the race guest I stood outside of the mausoleum of Augustus in Rome, but have long since vanished. Uh, and this, the mausoleum of Augustus looks slightly less like a building site now, but as you can see, it doesn't look like the kind of impressive marble clad. Uh, thing you might expect to be where the, an emperor was buried. Uh, and that's because a lot of the fancy decorative stuff has just been lost over the years. And probably the bronze slabs with the race guest eye on them were pretty early lost because, you know, bronze you can melt down and recycle into other things. Um, but kind of surprisingly, there are three examples of the race guest eye that are still extant, all from the province of Galatea in what is now Turkey. Um, that makes it one of very few lengthy texts from the ancient Roman world that isn't dependent on like having been copied by monks over the over the centuries. Um, roughly contemporary copies are were on buildings. Um, it is written in the first person, and it is generally agreed that it was composed by Augustus himself. The text claims to be a pretty straightforward list of his accomplishments, beginning shortly after the death of Julius Caesar and ending with the statement that he wrote it in his 76th year, which is 13 or 14 CE. This is the location of where one of the texts was. I take up three primary issues in my reading of the race guest I. First, I look at how the mature Augustus reconfigures the actions of the young Octavian. Um, who is himself, but younger. Octavian came to power through a series of illegal or at least untraditional actions, but Augustus rewrites this period to make his younger self seem both morally correct and utterly Roman, creating an exemplary figure out of some extremely transgressive acts. 
Second, and probably most important, I'm interested in how Augustus's successes in both his youth and his life as a whole match up to the traditional areas for the performance of masculinity. I show that the print cap selects the most, po uh, the most important public arenas for display, which is political and military spheres and public benefactions, and that his activities do generally fit into a very traditional Roman idea of manhood with some important qualifications. As part of both of the first two sections, I also examine the role of other groups, especially the Senate of Pe and people of Rome in his narrative. As part of his insistence on the traditional and legal nature of his role in the state, Augustus frequently emphasizes how the Senate and people legitimated, supported, and even created his powers and position. Uh, finally, I, I consider what Augustus leaves out. The most glaring omissions are the names of the defeated. Brutus, Antony, Sextus, Pompey, none of them are named in the text. Furthermore, the text largely omits the names of other Roman males, with the exception of the if they're part of a dating formula. The women of the imperial house are also completely absent, although the relationships of marriage and blood that they cement are not. Augustus focuses his version of his life story on himself and his public actions with very little room for others. All right. So the Res Gestae is a longish text, and it is divided by modern editors into chapters, which is little sections that are kind of thematically linked um, and are ranged from one sentence to maybe five or six sentences long. Only the first two chapters of the Res Gestae deal specifically with the career of the young Octavian. Uh, the longer first of these covers his actions from Caesar's assassination, sorry, from Julius Caesar's assassination in 44 BCE, up until the forming of the Triumvirate in 43 BCE, the Triumvirate being a group of three men who were um, asked by the Senate and people of Rome to fix things. <laughs> there were a bunch of problems and they were supposed to fix them. Um, so that's the longer first chapter. Uh, a single sentence suffices for the war against the Caesar of Killers that's in the second chapter. So when Augustus looked back in his old age, he emphasizes some aspects of his youthful actions and omits or glosses over others. So here we have, age 19, I mustered an army at my personal decision and at my personal expense, and with it I liberated the state, which had been oppressed by a despotic faction. Augustus begins the text with his age. He's only 19, He's placed in a prominent position and underlining his extreme youth at the beginning of his career. At a point when most aristocratic youths were either beginning their military service or doing a kind of apprenticeship in public speaking, Octavian raised an army and saved the Republic. So in a way, Octavian is a model youth. He is active, even proactive. He identifies problems that need his particular aid and he attacks them. Comparisons to other youthful saviors were likely noted at the time and have been certainly noted by modern scholars, uh, in particular two Romans called Scipio Africanus and Pompey, both of whom received uh, the power to command from the Senate at an unconventionally young age, and both of whom went on to provide exemplary service to the state. So Octavian is kind of presented as another in this list of exemplars. By the time he wrote the race guest type, Augustus had also shown an abiding interest in guiding the young men of his family and of the Roman elite in general down suitable paths towards adulthood. By placing his own youthful exploits so prominently in his summary, he presents himself as a model. But what sort of model he is and for whom are not questions with simple answers. Augustus's brief account of the events of 44 and 43 after this sentence, actually puts much of the responsibility for the events in the hands of the Senate and people of Rome. Go back to this one. Um, after a pair of first-person verbs in the opening sentence, which are mustered, I mustered, I liberated, the remaining verbs in this section, sorry for it being tiny, um, are all in the third person. So for this re reason, the Senate passed honorific decrees. Admitted me to the bo its body in the consulship, 
of Gaius Pansa and Aulus Hirtius. Uh, at the same time, giving me consular precedence and stating my opinion, and it gave me supreme command. To prevent the state from suffering harm, it ordered me as proprietor to take precautions together with the consuls. In the same year, moreover, the people appointed me consul after both consuls had fallen in war and triumvir for settling the state. So after that pair of first-person verbs, we move into the rest of them being third-person. The Senate admitted, the Senate gave, the Senate ordered, and the people appointed. These actions of the Senate and people are a reward for the actions undertaken by Octavian in the first sentence. Outstanding service to the Republic, which was central to Roman masculinity, is repaid by extraordinary honors, first from the Senate, then the people. Um, it is worth noting that when they brought, when they let him into the Senate, um, in theory, you shouldn't be in the Senate if you're under 28 at this point, and he's 19. So this is an extraordinary honor to be given. Uh, when they appoint him consul, you shouldn't be consul until you're 42. So this is a very young age to be appointed consul. Um, so, um, so what we can also see here, though, is that Octavian's extraordinary actions of mustering an army, which he was compelled to take because of a crisis, are quickly both legitimized and brought under control by his elders. The Senate and the people take over. The race guest I offers a model of responsible youthful action recognized by the systems of authority in place in the Republic. Despite this, it is very unlikely that Augustus wanted to be a model for every young Roman man. The audience he wishes to inspire with his successes is restricted to his own successors, the young men of his own family. Augustus spent much of the latter part of his life trying to find and train a young man to share his responsibilities and position. Um, many of these men are mentioned in the course of the race guest I. For the men of the imperial house, Augustus' achievements were a model and would remain so for generations, if not centuries to come. Ideally, imperial power would be sanctioned by a willing and grateful Senate and people as long as it was used to serve the state, regardless of how the power was acquired. For other aristocratic young men, though, Augustus's model was not a particularly good one, as the only thing it could possibly do would be to lead them to challenge the supremacy of his dynasty and therefore lead to a renewal of civil disturbance, which he did not want. Because, and the reason that this is a problem is it's not very hard to take Octavian's actions and make him a danger to the Republic, an affront to Julius Caesar's legacy, and even a public enemy. Octavian raised a private army which he marched on Rome. <laughs> By colluding with conservative forces in the Senate, including those who publicly sanctioned Julius Caesar's murder, he acted against Caesar's legacy. His private army then joined a fight against Mark Antony who was both a loyal general of Caesar and a holder of legitimate power. Whereas Octavian at this point, he's just, he's just some guy. He's some, some young guy. Um, raising a private army could be the action of a hero of the Republic, but much more often it suggested attempts at tyranny. The interpretation that opens the race guest eye, that Octavian acted to save the Republic, is not the only possible one. A slight shift in our point of view makes him the enemy of the state, not the unnamed Antony. But Octavian's position as savior of the state is, is um, kind of cemented by this bit, by this retroactive approval of the traditional authorities of Senate and people. Even this approval, though, is more complex than the text would suggest and leads to the question of what Augustus has left out from the tale of the young Octavian. First, uh, there was actually quite a lot of conflict and controversy behind the approval of the Senate, uh, which we know from some other sources from the time, uh, especially the letters of the orator Cicero, who was involved in all of this. Second, the statement that the people made him consul is telling. Up until this point, the Senate has been the subject of the third person verbs. The switch here is done without fanfare, but obscures the very real opposition of the Senate to the election of the 19-year-old Octavian and heir of Julius Caesar as consul. 
The most glaring omission, though, is actually one that I, it's maybe less obvious, which is the his fellow triumvirs. Augustus says the people made him triumvir for setting, for settling the state. A triumvir is a Latin word that literally means three men. So you cannot be a single person as a triumvir. There has to be two <laughs> others. Um, but he doesn't, nowhere in the in the in this text does he name the other two men. They're Antony and Lepidus, both of whom I think we'll see a little later. Um, so this brief, brief paragraph also, not surprisingly, omits a lot of the details of the military actions undertaken by Octavian and the other uh, triumvirs in the civil wars, which included things like fighting and killing other Roman armies and various atrocities. Uh, especially there were some atrocities in this thing called the proscriptions. Uh, a proscription means that the authorities, the triumvirs, posted a list of names of Roman citizens who could be killed without, who could be like extrajudiciously killed, who anybody could kill. This is a problem. One of the basic rights of being a Roman citizen was that you could not be executed without trial. Um, and so it was basically a way of them getting rid of their enemies. So we have a lot of atrocities happening here, um, but Augustus leaves them out, which I mean, kind of makes sense. He's writing a proud declaration of his achievements and providing a model for the young men of the imperial family, dwelling on the real harm he caused to Roman citizens as a youth, uh, a youth who may not have been the perfect model of mature Roman manhood would be utterly out of place in this kind of text. So the second chapter of the Reis Gestae, because we're still, that was just the first. The second chapter of the Reis Gestae states the culmination of Octavian's youthful career. He says, those who killed my father I drove into exile by way of the courts of law, exacting retribution for their crime. And afterwards I defeated them twice in battle while they were making war upon the state. Um, so these people he's referring to are the people who had killed Julius Caesar, led by two men called Brutus and Cassius. As with the first chapter of the text, this section is quite brief, includes a positive interpretation of Octavian's actions, and excludes any mention of other people involved. Augustus probably had to include the defeat of Caesar's killers in his summary of his life's achievements, because his power, his, at least early on, was based on his identity as the heir of Caesar. The young Octavian established his adulthood and affirmed that he took his filial duties seriously through the vengeance that he exacted on Caesar's killers, which was an act of pietas, a word that has many meanings, but in this uh, particular context means familial duty. But he claims that he carried out this duty to his father by completely legal and nonviolent means. He drives them into exile through prosecution, presumably for murder, which was a capital charge. The central part of the statement, which I have bolded in the English and the Latin, um, belongs grammatically with the action of driving them into exile. So the um, exacting retribution for their crime, that is with the driving into exile. But it also casts a shadow over the second half of the sentence. The overt meaning of the second clause is that Octavian only made war on the Tyrannicides after they made war on the state. His personal need for revenge had been satisfied after he drove them into exile. But that word, ultus. Most readers would be unable to dissociate the victory at Philippi, which is over Brutus and Cassius, uh, a military victory. Uh, they, most people would be unable to dissociate it from vengeance, especially given this word, ultus. Augustus built a, ma a monumental complex, which we call the Forum of Augustus, and the centerpiece of it was a temple to Mars Ultor, Mars the Avenger, vowed as thanks for the war god's help in avenging Caesar. This temple and forum are mentioned later in the Res Gestae, but here the vengeance aspect of the military conflicts with the forces of Brutus and Cassius is glossed over. They are made criminals against whom Octavian battles on behalf of the Republic. Augustus in the Reis Gestae separates his private action as a son from his public service to the state. While I'm talking about things that he's left out, uh, the more glaring omission, if you, if you didn't know about Mars Altor, fine, whatever, but there's a much more glaring omission here, and that's the uh, mm -hmm. defeating them twice in battle. 
because we are missing his fellow triumvirs, Mark Antony and Marcus Lepidus. Both of these men were significantly more experienced in military matters than Octavian was at, the, at in his youth. Lepidus was in Rome during the battles, so leaving him out of the narrative, fine. But almost everybody, including people writing hundreds of years later after Augustus had won everything, pretty much everybody agrees that Mark Antony actually won these battles. Um, Octavian was sick for part of them. He was in a tent, um, not really actively leading the battles. Antony was the true winner. But in the years after he defeated Antony in a further set of civil wars, Augustus, now the mature Augustus, no, younger, no longer the youthful Octavian, he worked pretty hard to separate himself from the other triumvirs. This is part of the reason I think that their names aren't actually in this text. Um, and he was especially working hard to, to separate himself from some of their and his morally questionable actions. There was a concerted effort to place the blame for the atrocities of the prescriptions on Lepidus and especially Antony, and to distance Augustus from some other things the triumvirs did, like confiscating land from Roman citizens, uh, and various smaller civil conflicts. Augustus rewrote his early career to be one of restraint and service to the Senate and Republic, but in doing so, he does have to engage in significant editing. Some of the activities that the young Octavian had engaged in were not ones that the elderly Augustus would want other Romans to imitate, and so he carefully chooses incidents that construct a restrained and dutiful young man. This is a foundation on which Augustus builds a life story filled with personal success, but always in service to Rome, which brings me to my second thing I'm looking at, which is how does his actions fulfill Roman masculinity? All right. So the achievements that Augustus lists in the race guest, I do largely line up with the traditional areas of elite masculine endeavors and actually add up to a preeminently successful importance of, uh, sorry, successful performance of Roman masculinity on the Republican model. Augustus, I would say, doesn't actually experience a crisis. Everybody else might, but he does not. <laughs> um, so the first sections after the summary of his youth, which are chapters three and four, give a general overview of his military leadership, including his generosity to veterans and triumphs and other honors which the Senate awarded him which are on here, and you can kind of look at that at your leisure. Um, um, his prioritization of military matters may point to the traditional precedents given to them in the Republic. Uh, during the, the Republic, it was very unusual for a man to achieve political prominence without first having at least adequate military performance. Later in the text, he also records territorial gains that he was responsible for but also gains he didn't make that he could have. Um, he, says, he says that he chose not to make Armenia a province and explains that this choice was in deference to Republican precedent. He says, I preferred, according to our ancestral customs, not to make it a province. Augustus thus continues to follow this pattern of innovation tempered with respect for tradition that he set up in the first two chapters of the text. But, and this is where I want to draw people's attention back to the words that I've got in bold here. Augustus's military career was far removed from that of a Republican general, even the warlords of the late Republic. The sheer mass of troops uh, and benefits conferred upon them dwarfs every previous general. The same is true of his triumphs, ovations, and thanksgivings. Twice solid triumphal ovations, three times driven triumphal chariots, 21 times as victorious general. Uh, the Senate 55 times decreed that Thanksgiving should be offered to me. The total number of days on which these Thanksgivings were was 890. All of these honors are in accordance with Roman tradition, but such a number of them for a single man is unprecedented. Augustus hides his innovation in plain sight. And all his middle military achievements, not just his youthful actions, are exemplar in both sides, senses of the word, things to be admired and emulated, but also things to be avoided if you're not in the imperial family. They may be intended as a blueprint for his heirs to follow. The loyalty of the legions will be essential to the maintenance of any emperor's reign. 
um, as will at least a veneer of personal military success. But he certainly would not want most Romans to act as he did or gain the honors he did. Augustus fulfills the model of Republican martial masculinity to such an overwhelming extent that there is no room for anybody else. And the same can be said of his political achievements, uh, which continue his practice of more than fulfilling masculine roles while maintaining at least a pretense of moderation and respect for tradition. Augustus proudly proclaims that he refused the dictatorship. That's the first quote up there. Um, and he refused a perpetual consulship, which is great. He also claims that he refused any magistracy that was not according to Roman custom. But he also lists a whole pile of posts that he did accept. He was consul 13 times. He held tribunician power 37 times. He was the overseer of the grain supply. He was a triumvir. He was the highest ranking senator. He had more priesthoods than any one man had ever held at the same time ever in Rome. As was the case of the with the first section of the race guest eye, Augustus does make sure to credit the Senate as a group as a source of his power. But at the same at the same time, he actually makes himself seem to be the one who is restraining the Senate and people when their enthusiasm for granting him honors exceeds the bounds of tradition. Um, so not only is he having a lot of honors, but also he's refusing some honors. And he's kind of taking on the role as the one who has to maintain tradition because everybody else would love to just get rid of it, so says Augustus. Um, at uh, chapter six, for example, he declares that many wished him to accept magistracies against Roman custom. Uh, later, he proudly proclaims that he refused to replace his former triumviral colleague, the unnamed Lepidus, as Pontifex Maximus, chief priest in his lifetime, but he makes sure to, to slide in that he was immediately and unanimously elected as soon as Lepidus died. Near the end of the text, he revisits these points, noting that he returned the Republic to the Senate and people in 27 BCE and stating that from that point on, he possessed greatest auctoritas, which is like influence kind of, uh, but had no more power than any other magistrate. Augustus carefully maintains this idea that he was a first citizen, not a monarch. And yet the scope of Augustus's political career, much like his military career, was unprecedented and certainly did not set a pattern for men outside of his lineage. The final aspect of the race guest eye in this section is the generosity of the princeps, which I can go through fairly quickly. Uh, public spirited giving was another vital part of Roman public life. Uh, of, of the part of the performance of masculinity. So in addition to gifts that he gave the people of Rome as part of his father's will, and to an initial settling of veterans after the civil wars were over, chapter 15 lists the gifts of money and grain granted over the course of his lifetime, always to large numbers of recipients. And I've kind of, that's what I put on this slide, um, to not less than 250,000 people, to 320,000 of the urban plebs to a little more than 200,000 people. Augustus's largesse is extreme and ensures the loyalty of the people of Rome is direct directed at him. For well over a century, gifts to the people had been a standard way for politicians to gain the favor of the electorate and thus the political uh, success that was part of the performance of masculinity. In practice, Augustus did no, was no longer needed this popularity for electoral success, but he had plenty of other reasons for courting it. Uh, Street-level violence in Rome, partly fueled by poverty, frequently plagued Rome in the late Republic. This mob violence was often led by men who harnessed it for their own political agendas, and those times were not that far in the past for Augustus. But Augustus, through his generosity, ensures that no one can outbid him for the allegiance of these unspecified people and urban plebs. Their support, along with the army, was one of the pillars of Julius Caesar, and Augustus understood its value. Besides the grant of money and, gra and grain, he lists specific benefactions to the city, including his famous restoration of temples. Uh, temple construction and restoration was generally paid for with war booty, and Augustus essentially had access to the entire empire's war profits uh, and provincial revenues as kind of a long-term spoils of war. Uh, his benefactions are therefore connected to his military success. 
Augustus concludes this section of the text with a list of games that he financed, either on his own or on, or on his own behalf or on behalf of his family members. And here I have to make sure I get the numbers. Gladiatorial games in his name and those of his sons and grandsons that included some 10,000 gladiators in total. Athletic games, uh, secular games, various other games, beast hunts comprising 3,500 animals, a naval spectacle, the description of which includes the enormous size of the excavations for the pool that it was held in, and the number of ships, 30, and men, 3,000, involved. Vowing, building, and dedicating temples and sponsoring games was again part of the traditional activities of the Roman elite, but as usual, we do see this massive difference of scale. Augustus alone could act as benefactor to Rome and her people on a far greater scale than had ever been seen before, making his performance of this traditional Roman role outweigh that of any other man. It is notable that although Augustus's achievements all technically fall into the realm of traditional masculine endeavors, they are far out of proportion with the deeds of even the most successful Republican magnates. They are also completely removed from the spirit of elite competition that both compelled and rewarded earlier Roman aristocrats. I mean, Augustus even leaves out the names of his colleagues and ad adversaries. This is not about competition. This is about Augustus. Even among the members of Augustus's family, there are notable absences, especially the women. Despite their significant role in dynasty building and in the public image and activities of Augustus's regime, not even the most prominent women are mentioned, not even obliquely. The Race Gestae is a masculine text. Augustus's summary of his life's accomplishments highlights his, his, uh, per his achievements in traditional public areas and the only others that he mentions by name are the younger men whom he expected to follow his example. This is not a document to provide a model for Roman men in general. It is a statement that Augustus has fulfilled the traditional roles so well and completely that there is no place for anyone else at the top. Augustus has removed military leadership and conquest, public offices, and public largesse at Rome from the realm of open competition. Any lesser success in these areas is ultimately thanks to the patronage of Augustus and elite competition will need to move on to other areas. That's the end. Thank you.